So welcome everyone. We have our fabulous webinar, a very interactive uh, session today on the international supply chain and leadership lessons with the lovely Kelly Crossley. What a talented woman um, she is. And we really look forward to hearing her experiences and being inspired by uh, her work in this space. But before I do that, just like to acknowledge the land on which we're all meeting. We're coming in from all around Australia. Uh, it's what we love about this organisation. The collective actually attracts um, leaders from one end of Australia to the other. I'm actually on this beautiful country in uh, Bulu in Perth, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm actually in North Perth. This is actually... Um, uh, Wujak, the country of the Wujak people of the Noongar Nation, and uh, it is really a special place, a fairly high point where I am, but it's a part of a water tributary that went through the Swan River uh, right through to um, right past Herdsman's Lakes. It was very traditional and important um, land for Aboriginal people uh, for hunting and gathering and, and for um, their ceremonies um, in this particular region. So very important time for those of you who are on the fence um, with regard to the referendum, I highly um, recommend you listen to the podcast that our fabulous Leanne Jeffrey, who's on the call here, did with Kyra Galanti, who's one of our members. Uh, she's actually a part of the representation of Reconciliation Australia that was invited to Uluru's, um, to the Uluru uh, Statement of the Heart, um, which has actually been at the basis of the request from Aboriginal people to consider being included um, in our constitution. And I think it's really worth hearing from Kyra. Um, she's it's very articulate. She's a very um, intelligent uh, woman. And I think hearing the perspective and understanding where the some of the controversy might be coming from, from her uh, perspective, it's really actually um, been an eye opener for all of us. We also did a webinar with Kyra, which was quite interactive earlier on. So um, we can, uh, I think Leanne can put the links um, to the podcast and to the webinar in the chat box for those of you who want to copy those and catch up. We'd love you to do that. Um, clearly, uh, Business Women in Australia is supporting the yes vote. Okay, I am Lynn Hawkins. I am the National Director and the founder of Business Women Australia. We, we've, I think we're over eight years old now. We've been uh, a national collective of female leaders in business across sectors, across states, across professions. Uh, we're a mixture of business owners and executives. Uh, we are women who are trying to work together collaboratively to raise um, issues that we believe need to be discussed to be able to join forces to raise the visibility of women and to share our knowledge and expertise in closing the gap um, and inspiring other women to step up as well. So it's a wonderful collective. Uh, for those of you who are interested in being a part of um, our mission um, to really help each other achieve our, our dreams and our and our goals, um, have a chat to Leah Jeffrey. She'll stay on the call after this or she'll talk about what's coming up um, towards um, in the calendar. I think we ran 90 events over the last 12 months online and in person. There's loads going on and we love curating events around our different members. So. Now, if this sounds like something that you would like to be involved with, uh, we have a few new faces on the call. We would love um, to have you join us. So without further ado, I want to introduce Kelly, um, Kelly Crossley. Now, international supply chain is not necessarily a topic that we've ever done before. So we were so excited when Kelly joined Business Women Australia. And I got chatting to her about this important role and and getting her insights pre-COVID or very early days of what was going on yes. was just so interesting. You know, Kelly was telling me, go out and get your Christmas shopping done now. I think it was May or June that we were we were chatting. She said, you know, there's going to be some, there's going to be some pretty much big stuff going down. It's going to be hard getting stuff. The shelves are going to be empty. Now this is, this is, she's not a futurist, but honestly she could see what was coming because she's yes. sitting right there at the coal phase. So I'm absolutely delighted to interview Kelly. She's the owner and director of Transatainer. They're an independent Australian logistics company providing freight forwarding, customs brokerage and logistics services for local, for national and international importers and exporters. 
And so this was great opportunity to have a deep dive, I thought, into the importance and the function of that international and global supply chain, but also look to actually chat about the opportunities for women to consider mm -hmm. this. It's a very unusual career choice in some regards, but there will be some time for Q&A. Um, Kelly's passion is absolutely infectious and culture is very important to her. But before we dive into all that um, um, detail around that, I just, I want to know, Kelly, how did you end up in this space? <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably the biggest question that most people ask. And if you uh, if you ask most people in our industry, everybody will simply say, we fell into it. And that's literally how it happens because nobody knows what a freight forwarder is. And I think I remember having this conversation with you at the very start and you're saying, well, what do you do? Like, what is it? And we come across that all the time. So um, like everybody else, I literally fell into it. Uh, my dad was in logistics and, and I, I worked part time for my dad coming out of school and I sort of was already in that in that realm, I guess worked for a career company and then all of a sudden I saw a job advertised for a freight forwarder and I thought oh, I don't know what the hell that is but I'm going to I'm going to apply for it I think it was 18 so applied for the job didn't know what it was uh thought I'd just figure it out on on the spot and I did and and I stayed with that company for 11 or 12 years and I worked my way up through that company so um you know I, yeah I got exposed to imports exports admin AC, a bit of everything then 11 or 12 years later I, I sort of bit the bullet and went out on my own basically two other business partners at the time but yeah it's it that, that's 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 the short version of what happened for me but m most people you fall into this industry because it's not a well-known industry people don't know what we do and it's such an important industry so explain its importance oh it's everything I mean, I think COVID proved that, but the the world, Australia will stop. Australia will stop if you don't have people like us moving freight, um, you know, and, I, and, and it was proved during COVID because everyone was saying, well, where's my TV? Where's my couch? Where's my, you know, everything's imported. There's no, there's not a lot of manufacture in Australia, um, you know, even from food, you know, so it's huge it's a it's a vital role it's a ro vital role in the global economy um so yeah it's the country will stop if we don't keep moving freight and that's that's pretty much as simple as it is yeah. and there's still some issues of course with some some of the movement of products and services or products at the moment around the globe isn't there what what are you seeing yeah. it's it's a lot better now i mean 3 years ago in covid you know, when it first hit, I think it was nobody knew what was going to happen. So, you know, we sort of all sort of prepared for the worst, I guess. Um, yeah, sure, it was a really challenging time. But I think um, for me, I look at it as adversity brings opportunity. So while it was challenging, uh, I found it fascinating. I, I kind of, I kind of, I enjoyed it, to be honest. I'd almost like to go back to those times in, in, in a way. I can see Amanda <laughs> from ES uh, having a bit of a chuckle there too. So I'm sure she relates. <laughs> it's, it, it's a crazy time. You know, we've gone from, um, in terms of COVID, uh, you know, we, we were, things that we saw, for example, were your ocean freight rates from the shipping lines were sitting at, you know, maybe a thousand dollars, and and they peaked at thirteen thousand dollars for a for a container. So the inflation that you see on the on the um, shop now is because of the prices. People can't import, you know, container after container, and, and you were buying at a thousand dollars, and now you're buying at thirteen thousand um, dollars. Shanghai to LA, for example, I think the prices of those boxes was twenty four thousand US dollars. And the vessels were full, like completely full. So there was those things happening. There was, you couldn't, there was a, a, a physical global shortage of containers around the world. So when you have different countries locked down at different times, um, the contain, the empty containers are no longer in the places that they need to be. Um, you know, they might be 
still sitting there with cargo in them because those countries were in, in lockdown. So we then saw that there was no containers available. Usually you would, you would make a booking on a shipping line and you'd get a booking and you'd move it within a week. You know, we had containers that we couldn't get bookings for six weeks, eight weeks. So problematic. Yeah, and the, um, the images, you know, we were seeing these images in our lounge rooms, you know, through the news and what have you, and all of a sudden it was it was brought into everyone's kind of awareness yes. how important this this industry was. I mean, it was, you know, and I can remember, I remember got off the call to you and I said, to yes. you know, Kelly's really excited about problem solving, like she's a problem solver. So yes. she's loving this. <laughs> Yeah. I, remember that, I remember that very first conversation and it was it was extremely passionate between us because I was saying all these problems but to me it was just it was exciting like yeah, for me and I always say a problem just means a solution you know yeah. it's not the end of the world there's a solution there it might not always be the one that uh you know it, it, it's your first choice but there's always a solution um so yeah you had to I think in that time, all freight forwarders, we had to think on our toes. We had to maybe change the way your business was structured. Um, meeting customer ex expectations become a little bit challenging, but again, it's being transparent. Um, and, you know, a lot of businesses had to change their business module. Yeah. So, yeah and you had, it was about education to, to say, well, this is what we're dealing with. This could be around for the next three years. Um, you know, you've got to change the way you start your buying, your procurement. It has to change. Otherwise, and as we know, people want to buy that couch now. They don't want to wait, right? So, you know, you can't just do a just-in-time module. It has to be a just-in-case module. So people have got to have that stock in there just in case someone wants to buy it, not, you know, just in time. And then you go to a whole scenario of cash flow and all those sorts of things, but... Yeah, so it was, it, it's a complex, very, very complex, intricate uh, industry, that's for sure. Yeah. Fascinating. And I can see now why so many of my buddies are, have been buying warehousing and commercial oh. properties to lease out. They're the smart ones. I know. Just, it's just not a tweet why yes. they're doing that. So I've been, 100%. You know, every time oh, I catch up with these guys, it's like building up a warehouse for someone. Yeah. And that's what it is. It's this move away from yeah. the just in just in time in to the just in case so they're actually needing to hold a little bit of stock yeah um, so for that buffering yep. which so is it does change everything yep most folders uh, most um you know purchases they would buy on that that sort of scenario usually yeah. they had to change yeah. and you know, i understand as an importer that that impacts their cash flow too right so you know you, you do you want to have two million dollars worth of stock sitting in your warehouse well it's, that's not ideal so that that other module you know that works yeah. but you can't it, it couldn't work it couldn't work in COVID. you know you well, need it was, a, it was high risk wasn't it they didn't think it was ever going to be high risk but obviously i mean who would have thought we've had a a, a global economy yes. shut down i mean it's just it's bizarre and we've lived through a piece of history yes um, and we'll talk about it with our grandchildren probably they won't be that interested but yeah. the reality is, is that it's, it's massive and we've lived through it and we're just yep. still seeing just yep. still seeing it sort of coming back online so yep. when we talk about the sectors that you play yeah you know what what are in this vital part of our australian economy what are the sectors that that yep. you're really seeing uh growing yep. and where where do you play that might be unusual yeah look for us i mean we're we're sort of a folder that uh it's a general commodity for us we don't i don't particularly look at a particular trade lane or a particular commodity um i don't really target anything like that for me i haven't been one of those folders that uh and a lot of them have you know maybe seven or eight or ten years ago they chased the the mining industry because obviously you know in the mining where that is where the money is and that that sort of thing i'll be really honest um i, I stood away from that I, I just thought that that for me was a short-term goal uh that eventually it would come off the boil and and if you put all your eggs into that basket then things would you know potentially happen i generally think that that's happened now there's there's you know been some bigger folders that maybe have had to downsize because they have chase that pathway um, for me it was just remaining true to myself and that's 
um, looking after you know general commodities, medium small to medium sized businesses. In saying that, you know we also look after some large, very very large businesses as well, um, and because of the service that we provide, and that's I, you know I think where we set ourselves apart in in terms of the service levels. So. Um, yeah, and, you know, in terms of trade lanes, I think everyone still has their strengths and most of us, is, in particular in, in WA, we would be strong with, you know, China, Southeast Asia sort of business, um, which is where we are quite strong at. But in saying that, we've also diversified in terms of, you know, Europe, um, we're strong in America, you know, we're bringing freight out of Turkey, Italy, uh, Rotterdam. So there's a, pretty much everywhere, to be honest. Um, and the commodities can range, yeah. And, and exports, you know, we weren't really big on exports for us. We were predominantly an inbound uh, business, but we've diversified over the last 12 months um, by bringing somebody in who's really changed that for us and brought a lot of exports in, which is really good. Yeah, and also even other revenue streams, you know, we're doing, we might be doing hot shots to Darwin and, you know, for subsea companies and things like that. So it's just sort of sounds cliche, one-stop shop, but I guess that's pretty much what, we're trying, what we are. Uh, and I hate using that term, but that's pretty much what we are and what we've become. So what would be the trigger for, say, a business? They've got to a point where they realise they need, actually need someone that's going to be, able to help them in this space what would be the usual scenario what is it that is it when they actually are in their business development stage and they've yep. uh, located a product that they're needing to shift and then they know to start thinking about this or do they start trying to do it themselves and then think god oh, there's got to be someone else who knows how to do this better or yeah i think so i think when somebody goes to source products and things uh then they start to realize that it, that it can be quite complex um, and it depends on what commodities you're talking about. You know, if you bring in something that is general, it, it can be quite straightforward. But, you know, if you have a client that rings up and, and you know, they want to import something that's, you know, a food product and it's got dairy or, you know, uh, egg or you, you sort of just go, hang on a minute, stop. You need to look at this. It's not straightforward. So in terms of importing, um, a lot of people sometimes get caught out because they think it's really straightforward. It's actually not. There's a lot of complexities on the border clearance, for example. Um, there's permits required. You know, you might bring in a car or you might bring in a trailer. Well, have you thought about getting a permit? Well, why do I need a permit? You know, you know you've got to go to DOTAS, you need a permit. So, yeah, they, they would probably start the ball rolling the the best thing that they can always do is speak to a forwarder or a broker because it, it's not so straightforward. And a lot of people import cargo and then they realise, you know, oh, well, I've just been hit up with $2,000 of arrival and port charges. We see that all the time because they've been told from the shipper, we'll just get it to the port for you. Well, that's great, but how are you going to get it from the port to your door? <laughs> it's got to go through customs. It's got to go through quarantine. You have to pay the terminal fees. You have to pay the wharf. You have to pay the transport. So it, it's you definitely need to get hold of a freight forwarder and walk through the whole scenario before you do anything. Well, it's and really, a, it's really a plan and a strategy, isn't it? I mean, it should be a part of a part. I mean, it's. I mean, I guess it would be if they are disciplined around business planning and really looking at everything first. But a lot of, in my experience, a lot yep. of uh, a lot of people get very excited about an idea and just start bringing stuff in. And, yes, you know, arriving, you know, even at their homes and. Yep. Well, yeah. you see it all the time. Somebody goes to Bali and they've found these really amazing cheap couches and they want to deck out their house and it's, you know, and, and all of a sudden they've brought all this furniture back from Bali and it, it arrives and it's like, well, hey, you've got to pay all this and you've got to clear it and it's, it's, it's wood and you haven't had it treated and now it's got to be fumigated and they're like, whoa, hang on a minute, it's just cost me $3,000. Like, yeah, exactly. It wasn't such a cheap deal after all. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't so cheap after all, yeah. So, Classic. yeah. Yeah, but a lot of people tend to do it, wear a straightforward and go, please, before you do anything, come and talk to us. We'll lay it down on the line for you. You can then make an educated decision. 
Oh, I love that. I um I actually did pick up some boxes in Bali when I was in my 20s. So I, yeah. I carried them back on this motorbike back to the place that I was staying with my friend. He was living over there. And yeah. I put it into, because I declared it, and they, it then cost me, I think, was something like four or $500 per big box because they were covered in shells and bark what? to fumigate. I think I didn't see them for about four months. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Just yeah. like, that's a classic, you know, classic, classic, classic twenty-year-old rookie thing, and it was a good thing to learn early in my in my life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, what sort of size would your clients be? I mean, what sort of value of um, transaction really does warrant getting you guys involved? Yeah. Uh, look, to, to be really honest, we we are happy to work with. You know, I call them the mums and dads businesses, like you know, the small businesses to the bigger businesses. So, I don't really like to pigeonhole myself in terms of what business we carry. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I still get involved in the seventy-five dollar career job just because I'm helping somebody out. Like I love doing that. It's maybe I shouldn't be doing it, uh, but <laughs> yeah, so Kelly. Oh, <laughs> but I love that. You know what? It's paying it forward, isn't it? Too. Yeah. And you know, you have somebody that's really anxious about doing something and then you sort of walk them through it and they're like, oh, it's not so bad after all. Mm. Um, so for us, yeah, look, uh, yeah, all sizes. We we might, we might can do some one-off imports. We can do clients that are bringing in millions of dollars of worth, worth of stock. Um, we're working with um, global companies uh, that are, you know, on the stock exchange. So it, it, it varies. There's no limit for me in terms of what we do. I guess what I am transparent about is if I can't do something, I will say to that person, I can't do it. I'll give you some guidance or I might tell you where to go or who to use. Um, but, you know, we, we can do most things. Most, most freight forwarders can do most things. It just depends on how good you do them, I guess. So, yeah, anyone and anything really for us. Yeah. So what, what I find interesting too is that now, now that we're starting to look at the movement outside the country um, yep. as well as as moving product into the country, yep. a lot of that is reliant to on those cross-border supply kind of effectiveness. So, I mean, what are you finding? You know, there's certain countries that it's really, you just know this is going to be hard work or... Yep. You know, Yep, yep. Uh, and you get that all the time. I mean, you know, there's obviously language barriers, there's, you know, cultural barriers. But when you've worked in that industry for a really long time, I think you you adjust to those, you start to understand those. Um, you know, and that becomes a lot of good personal development too, because you really respect all those different cultures and you get an understanding of it. Um and in saying that, to be honest, cross-border, we do cross-trade shipments. So, you know, we might be shipping from Shanghai into New Zealand, for example, where it doesn't even come into Australia. Um, we do a lot of those. We're moving stuff from India to Turkey at the moment. So it, it's it sounds complex, but it can be done. Um, it's just – and I think the other thing is having really good partners across the globe, and that's something that we're really well um, established with. We're in a couple of different networks. I invest time in those networks and building rapports um, yeah. with those agents. So that that includes travelling once or twice a year. You meet with them face to face. You build up those relationships. You know them. You know you're having personal conversations with them. It's all about that connection at the end of the, end of the day. I think that's really important as well. So you want them to be looking after your client. Um, like we look after them. So, and, and if it's if it's at the other end, you really need them to be looking after them at that other end as well. So, those connections are important. And what about insurance? You know, I'm sort of thinking through, you know, all the aspects of the business model and the costs associated. And you know, I, I imagine that insurers are prepared to insure some places. You know, yeah, and at a lower risk than other other sort of supply chain insurance. I mean, what 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 yeah. kind of insurances are attached yeah. to this space? That's in, that's that's a good one because marine insurance is is a it's a funny subject. I think uh, in in our industry, it's um, look uh, depending on your shipping terms. So without going into too many complex details in shipping terms, there's CIF, there's FOB, there's X Works. So. Uh, but in in terms of insurance, a freight forwarder can obviously, and we can offer insurance. 
um, and you you know same thing we go out to a to a uh, insurance broker and we give them all the details and they can insure it for us um, and obviously it depends on the commodity the country you know how it's packed how it's shipped if it's air seas it crated all those sorts of things so we pass that on to our insurance broker and they can give us a premium and we can pass it on to the customer some clients don't want to insure it or risky you know half the time does insurance ever get used and i'm pretty honest probably not to be honest but what happens if there's that one time that it does get used or the, you know, the ship sinks or the the uh, vessel gets stuck in the sewers canal and, you know, it's a general average and it, it happens. Right. That, it that's happens. the whole point of insurance. Right? The time and you haven't got it is the time you wish you had it. Yeah. And if you're yeah. importing, you know, cargo that's worth a million dollars or, or, you know, it might only be $25,000, you know, is a $200 insurance premium you know, kind of be sort of, uh, that's the way I look at it. Totally, I do too. Yeah. A lot of clients won't insure and that's also okay. That's their prerogative. Um, we leave that up to them. We, we disclose that, you know, insurance doesn't come when you ship freight freight you know, on an FOB terms. It's It doesn't come. So you need to either insure it, ask us to insure it, or alternatively, uh, what I try and encourage is have an open marine policy. If you're a regular importer, yeah. Um, have an open marine policy, and that will cover you all year round. It's cheaper, um, and it's and it works probably better for the importer. Great advice. And I've got a, a hand up here from uh, Andrew De Blanken from West Farmers. Andrew, do you yeah. want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll see if my video works as well. Um, oh, gorgeous. Here we go. <laughs> love that. I love seeing the faces. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not familiar with how Zoom works, so forgive me. You're doing well. <laughs> Um, just on, um, you know, what Kelly was mentioning about, um, you know, the insurance component um, and how that sort of ties in with, you know, inco terms and stuff like that. Um, so I, I've been in the industry for just over 20 years um, and throughout that time uh, we sort of, I never never uh, was exposed to inco terms um, yeah. in, in depth. So you hear of all the acronyms being thrown around. Um but you don't really know those in, in, in detail. And I think it for me, when I used to work at a freight forwarder, um, that, that would have been really useful um, knowledge to have when you yeah. when, when your customers come to you and say, oh, we've got this shipment, we want to um, ship it from A to B, and to be able to provide them with um, that guidance as to where the transfer of risk occurs um, and, and those cost responsibilities um, it is quite important. Um, for example, if you, you're shipping um, a containerized uh, product, a lot of people sort of go for the uh, CIF or CFR inco terms, Correct, um, yep. which is not really uh, the appropriate inco term to use for your containerized cargo because there's gaps um, where you might not be insured for, such as in the terminal, if something was to happen because that's outside of your control. Yeah. Um, so just understanding where those um, gaps are with the different inco terms, um, and to be able to explain that to your clients. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that that's that would have been really helpful for me um, when I was working for a freight forwarder. Yeah. Um, so I, I had recently completed the um, International Chamber of Commerce uh, inco terms twenty twenty course. Oh um, no. I think um, the. FTA, John. I see John's on the John call. Park. I think, yeah. Hi, John. Yes, I think. Hi, John. I think he was jumping on. I can't. Yeah. I see. Yeah, his name there. I think FTA actually offer um, an Inco Terms course as well. Yeah, John's um, in. Yeah, I just think that that is it, it's an amazing uh, course to do and and to learn in depth and to be able to pass on that knowledge to your customers in understanding where the transfer of of risk occurs and and what they need insurance for to be covered. Absolutely, yeah, I totally agree. Valid point. Yeah, and I think that's something that we uh, we definitely try and do. And and you know, if you're talking, especially if you're talking to somebody that's uh, maybe um, new to, to importing or exporting, is giving them that understanding of terms of when risk and liability costs transfer across, um, and especially with insurance as well. And I. I you know, Inco terms are something that's I think still to this day is a really complex issue. And as much as people have been in the industry, there's there's 
there's still grey areas, you know, as much people can be in the industry for 20 years and they're still like, well, DAP, I'm not sure where does that stop? And, you know, so I think you're right. It definitely is something that freight forwarders should probably know to, uh, you know, extensively and, and pass that knowledge on to, to um, buyers and make them understand. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yep. John Park, yeah. So you did the course through John. John, there's a there's a plug for you. He's given us a wave there. Um, I'm sure. Bill, did you did you want to share a few thoughts? Yeah. Look, thanks for that. And and Kelly's doing an amazing job. Um, certainly, FTA um, in conjunction with the Wise Tech Academy offer a range of courses across some um, inco terms and freight forwarding certainly customs breaking, but also just general knowledge sort of stuff that, that people should be aware of when they're shipping. And, you know, Kelly's done an excellent job there in covering off a number of them. You know, people don't realise what's needed when it gets to Australia. Um, and unfortunately, um, overseas embassies and consulates, when they get approached, don't really give enough information out. So you really do need to very well in advance of shipping the goods because once they get here, um, it's too late because if you haven't got the right paperwork, you're going to either possibly lose the cargo, it's going to have to be re-exported. So it's all of an extra cost that you don't need. And, you know, you really do need to speak to, as Kelly said, a freight forwarder or broker um, so they can walk you through it because, um, you know, you don't want to get to a stage where you've, you've spent a lot of money on cargo and getting it here and you can't get access to it because you haven't got a permit or you haven't done something right to buy a security or you haven't got a a free trade agreement that's going to give you the, a cheaper price. Yeah. So many, so many, honestly, there's so many variables, you know, we're talking about this and then you can, we, this, this is, this could open up a can of worms. You, we could talk for hours on this, but um, as John was saying, you know, returned cargo, we're, we're hitting BMSB season, right? So this is something completely different altogether. Um if you send an open top and it's not, you know, it's coming from a, a BMSB country and it's not fumigated and it, and it arrives, quarantine will just turn that container back around and it's just cost you $5,000. So I'm, I'm guessing BMSB is something to do with biosecurity? Correct, yeah. yeah so right. it's okay. the stink bug. It's the stink bug. So yeah. there's, uh, certain countries are, are um, on, the, on the target risk country list so obviously as folders and brokers we know what they are um somebody can't just ship a container from a country that is on the uh, list yeah so there's this wow, so many wow. it's just issues. so this um, i've got so many ideas for our next yeah. topic honestly yeah. kelly you know yeah. the whole strategy around import and export is yeah. i mean i'm just thinking over the years i've had all these various ideas you know typically of most entrepreneurs Yes. of what I'd like to, you know, ship in or ship out. And, yeah. But, you know, I hadn't even thought about the actual logistics and the strategy around the movement and yep. and, the, and the insurance and the allowances and what's Permits. okay and what's not okay. I mean, this is a minefield. And yeah. it, it's part of that strategic advisory piece that sitting, as you said, with guys like you and, and yeah. brokers, yeah. it's so important in yeah. that planning stage. Absolutely. Paying duty, you know, how yeah. much duty are you going to pay or can you get it duty free? Is there a tariff concession we can find for you? Yeah. You know, 5% duty, is it coming from a country where we have a free trade where well, we can get you, you know, the duty free, but you have to have the correct certificate of origin, you know, so we can save you the duty. If you don't have the certificate of origin, you're going to pay the duty. So, you know, there's all those things that people just, they don't, it's, it's a minefield. It's and there'd be there'd be potentially accountants and business advisors that are specialists in this space too, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, or are they, or does there any accountant say, "Oh, yeah, I could do that," and doesn't really know well, all the things to add in? I mean, what? It's, you know? I, I think sometimes it might be a little bit tricky because um, you know we we sometimes even say to clients, hey, you know, you're paying a lot of GST, are you GST deferred?" And they look at me like with this blank face. And what's GST deferred? My accountant doesn't know about it. I'm like, okay. Yeah, so then right. you're the accountant. Well, GST deferred is, you know, um, you've just paid, you've just paid, uh, for example, I had a client that paid $82,000 in GST um, on a particular shipment. And I said, are these regular shipments? Yes, they are. I said, well, they're coming from Vietnam. You're getting them duty-free. 
um, and you're now paying 10% GST, that's $82,000 that's just come out of your account. You're probably not going to recover it. Um, if your GST deferred... Oh, oh, John's jumped in there. If your GST deferred, um, you don't pay the GST. Yeah. So, so you know, um, it's it. So we're linked up to the ATO. Basically, we're revenue collectors for the ATO. Let's be honest. <laughs> that's the and other. That's, and that's from poor planning. You know, it, what you're what you're saying to me is that this is all stuff that if you really set up everything properly and carefully to start off with, and don't let your emotions run out of control, I have to bring this stuff in straight yeah. away. Um, <laughs> plan it out and yeah. get that information. Work out whether or not one, are you going to make money on this? I mean, I can imagine when I'm hearing you saying the ships are getting turned, you know, containers are getting sent back, I'm just going ka-chink, ka, -chink, ka, -chink, ka -chink. This is people <laughs> losing so much money. And I've seen it. Time and, and the emotional turmoil around all that, it just yeah. comes down to being more careful in their planning and thinking. Yeah. So, you know, this is such an important subject. Now, what about transitioning? I mean, how fierce is the competition? I mean, you're independent. Yeah, Um uh the competitions, it, it's extremely fierce. I mean, there's, I, I, I don't know, John might be able to tell me, There's there used to be over 100 and something freight forwarders just in, in Fremantle. Fremantle's not a big market, let's be honest. Um, so, look, we all know each other. The competition is fierce. Um, we come up against, you know, other independents. Um, we come up against multinationals. Uh, but, oh, look, for me... I'm one of those ones that I stay in my lane. I'm not too concerned about what other people are doing. Um, I, I do my own thing. Uh, Amanda, from is who's on the call, is from EES. Um, they're another independent, and, you know, we hang out. So um, I often bump into Amanda at functions, and we, we sit there and we chat and we talk, and we've got a really good relationship. Are we competitors? Absolutely, we're competitors, and I know the hack boys and... Uh, I think last week we were dancing together at the ball. So uh, the industry trade ball. Um, so, yeah, it's, but it's, a, you know, whilst we're all competitors, um, I think there's a lot of alliances amongst us. Um, and when I look at multinationals, a lot of them will, you know, offer, say they offer bigger things and they've got the warehouse and they've got the trucks and they've got the this. The difference for me is they don't have the service. So, you know, it's uh, it's a churn mill of staff. So, you know, you, I was speaking to somebody the other day and they had 23 staff members turn over in the last six weeks or something. Um, that to me, I, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't put my business there. You know, I want somebody that's, that is an independent, that does have staff that are sitting there, that are senior staff members, that uh, have the experience, that have the same care factor as what we do. Um competitive in price still so if you're getting the service if you're getting the price if you're getting all those things if you're getting a director and managers that sit in and and you know literally care i think that's what's really important you know you might have uh the bigger corporations that will only want to work with the bigger corporations in multinationals and that's all that's okay too yeah and, and what about your own business then i mean you know it sounds to me like you know, with so many different players in the space, mm. you know, what what are the goals for your business? Are you looking to scale? Or are you would you consider merging? I mean, what what are yeah. the sort of thing the big picture goals that you're thinking about for Transatainer? Good question, and it's something that's uh, it's something that's come up of late because I, I actually I think it was at one of your uh, functions. Uh, that I was chatting to somebody and funnily enough we got into this conversation and she said to me I can't remember who it was where do you see yourself in five years and I was I was like oh you know what I hadn't thought about that because I kind of my days just they blend and they're quick and it's very often very seldom sorry that I've had time to reflect and I thought I'm not really sure uh, and I sort of said, well, I'm kind of, I'm really happy where I am. The business is at a really good space. Um, I always said I'd like to get to a complement of, say, nine. That's where we're at. Um, I'm happy. I'm happy where I am. But then I walked away from that and I was like, hang on a minute. Well, I've just pigeonholed myself. Are you really happy with that? No. that's the So the switch has gone back on. 
uh, I've just gone, no, I'm not happy with that. You know, I have reached something. I'm, that's that's been complacent and I have a lot more now to achieve. So, yeah, look, for me now I've started to, I want to grow more now. <laughs> so from sitting comfortable growth, um, I, I think the hard part is with growth is then maintaining the same level of service that we've got now and that's that's key and critical to me I, I hold that really close to my heart that we offer those services and, and I genuinely care about our clients so I guess I didn't want to grow too big because I wanted to offer the same level of service so it's managing that making sure we give the same level of service um, but being able to grow on the same token so now I'm in I'm in the growth phase I'm starting to put wheels in motion already <laughs> to Sounds grow. Like we're again. going to be watching this space very closely and, and you've, yeah. you've been very passionate about um, encouraging women you know look to look at this as a career. Yep. What are the opportunities that you do see for um, you know young women who might be thinking about you know yep. stepping into this space? Oh so much opportunity and it is something that I'm passionate about um, and I work with some of our industry bodies um, for this um, you know, custom being a customs broker, for example, is a career choice. And for me, you know, a customs broker, they're a licensed broker. So, you know, they have to go and do their training. They have to do their CPD points. They have to remain licensed. I can't lodge an entry, for example, because I'm not a licensed broker. I hold the corporate license as a business, but I have to have a broker um, employed to lodge my entries and, and clear that cargo across the border. So much opportunity for women to come into that as a career path. Like it's it's a well paid job. Um, it's it, it's a career. I think the issue is not many people know about it. I'm sort of saying, well, can we not let people know? You know, like we're starting to sort of hit schools up and say, give this as an opportunity to school kids to say. This is a career path for you. Okay. Like if you go to the vet schools, they're looking at plumbing and electricians and hairdressing and traditional roles, but why not walk, walk into the roles of freight forwarding and, and being a customs broker? And that also opens up a lot of other doors, right? So not just a customs broker, there's diplomas of freight forwarding that are, that are there. You know, then you can go into warehousing, you can go into transport, you can go into... And that opens up travel. You know, if you end up being somebody that in my position, um, the travel, you know, I can travel anywhere in the world with, with my job. So, yeah, it's 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 definitely an opportunity for women to get into the freight forwarding spectrum for sure. It's such an exciting space. And and I, yep. I imagine when, when you're actually setting up your networks and nurturing those relationships internationally as well, as you get to meet these incredible people who... Yep. Are kind of like-minded they're all you know problem solving and help you know big kind of a, a an industry I imagine where people are very service oriented because they're trying to yep. find you know the right thing for people all the time the best way to do it yep um, Absolutely. So, so that value space would be kind of amazing in terms of the sort of people you're mixing with absolutely yeah and that's I've always said I surround myself around uh this the, those sorts of people um we don't we offer a service so it's not like we're a you know, uh, selling a cup and I can say this cup, you know, is this and this cup is this and you can compare. The only thing you can compare for me against my neighbour next door is the service and maybe our price and, and what we can offer. And then it becomes about relationships too. So, um, yeah, absolutely. They're, they're a couple of the biggest things. And you've, I mean, you're you're running a business. You've got, yep. you know, you've got things going on outside your work. Yep. You know, you've got a family, it's yep. all this stuff that's happening in your life. I mean, how do you stay so motivated and energised? I don't think I've ever seen you when you're not just bubbling with optimism and energy. Like, yeah, I know. Like, how is that? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably blessed by nature that that is my nature. Um, yeah, I think, 
you know, gratitude is a big thing for me. So uh, getting up, you know, and sometimes if I'm having a flat day, I, I, I'll wake up and I'll generally do gratitude, write down three things that you're grateful for. And that could just be that I had a nice warm bed to sleep in that night. You know, there's people that aren't, you know, that are homeless. So remaining grateful, having, you know, gratitude, um, staying energised sometimes, you know, might not see the obvious uh, answer but my kids. My kids uh, keep me inspired. If I, you know, if I can set some really good examples for my kids, and when I say kids, they're eighteen and and, and twenty. For me, they 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 look at they look at me. So I'm an example. If they see the mum going out there and getting it, making a name for herself, you know, getting what she wants from hard work, but still remaining humble. That, that's enough to inspire me as well, you know, and, and if you have your, my son who's 20 that says, I'm so proud of you, mum, with what you've achieved, wow, that's that, that for, I'm inspired just from, from that. Like I'm just like, okay, yeah, I've, that's, I've, I've won in life. Um, but, you know, so, so family, you know, obviously my parents, you know, you, you, want, you, you want to make your parents proud, those things still inspire you. To, to, to know, you know, I, I email my dad often with little things that I've achieved and that's just, that keeps me inspired. Um, and I'm one of those people that I just, I, I've listened to podcasts that are, you know, I could reel off podcasts, a mindset mentor and things like that that I might listen to on the way to work. It's just, just to remain in that positive um, frame. Those sorts of things I think are huge. Mindset is the biggest thing. Anyone can achieve anything. It's all about the mindset. So true. It's so true. And and so do you have any sort of favourite inspirational quotes or little mantras that you fall back on? And I've heard a few of them yes. coming through, peppering through this conversation. They've been yeah. some, some crackers. I've got lots, Lynn, to be honest. Um, and well, that's my cat banging. I've got lots. <laughs> My cat's decided to join the uh, the webinar. I've got lots. I funnily enough, I'm known as I'm known as the quote queen. So my staff will laugh at me because I'm always sending them a text with a positive affirmation or quote or something. Um, plenty. I could rattle them off. I always say to my staff, "Look, stay in your own lane. You know, love thyself." Um, what else do I say to them? Um, oh yeah, the, yeah. Plenty, yeah. There's, there's, there's heaps. I think I might have even making a note of some of that that I that I often rattle. Um, oh, simply, yeah, simply ones like you get back what you put in. I think is one for me. Uh, another one is comparison is the thief of joy. You know, people too. You know, too, too many people compare. If you're comparing to the person next door, just don't. You know, it takes away your joy. Don't don't compare. Yeah, and, and you're often looking at somebody's highlight reel, right? So don't look at it. You don't know what's really going on under their highlight reel. Um, and one big one, I think, and I try and say to my staff is get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? That's the only way you're ever going to grow. That's how I grew. You know, you have to make yourself really uncomfortable. Um, and simply, if you fall down seven times, get up eight. That you have to because yeah. you, you've got to fail at things and, and that failure is how you learn. So I, I, I believe in all those sorts of things. Yeah, I can see you're clearly a very resilient person. I mean, when we when we think about times when we might have failed or when things didn't go right, right yep. you know, quite often the things that we learn the most. Yep. Are there any sort of been any really big challenges that, that were that nearly broke you? Um, I, I don't, not really, to be honest, maybe I'm, I'm, I've been pretty lucky in that way, or I just get on with it. Um, obviously COVID was a challenge and, and that was an unknown. So, you know, at, at the start of COVID, I do remember sitting with my staff and before it really, the shit hit the fan, I sort of said, this is going to be bad. And they sort of went, oh, well, that's 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 not how Kelly talks. She's usually really positive, and I'm like, no, this is this is going to be bad. And they're like, how how do you know? What do you mean? I'm like, I just gut feel we're right at the start, but this is this is going to be bad. And I think maybe 
I'm blessed in a way that I do have that gut feel. I can foresee things a little bit. Um, so, you know, I sat down and, and we sort of ran through figures and, and we went through worst case scenarios. What happens if freight doesn't move for a period of time? Where does that leave your business? Um, look, it, it completely did the opposite. You know, it was a, it was a challenging time, but um, I loved it. Again, adversity brings opportunity. There was so much opportunity there. While everyone else might have been whinging and moaning, I was going, "This is this is cool." Like, there's there's so much we can take away from this, and there's so many lessons we can take away from this. Um, there's things that you know we need to change in the industry, which you know, like FTA and, and IFCABAR and things, they they advocate for us for those things. Um, yeah, I, I, challenges. Not, not, not really. I, I just see challenges as a solution. <laughs> I love it, and I can just see that is it is absolutely a blessing that you are wired up naturally in this way. You know, some of yeah. us have to work a bit harder to think like that and remind yeah. us of each thought and challenge the thought and then reframe. Yes, but really, whatever it is in your life and your DNA and whatever you've been blessed with, that's actually got that reframing going on. Yeah. subconsciously so that you see those those big challenges yeah okay this is this is going to be pretty shitty but hey what's the exciting piece about this you know being able to yeah. and enjoy it and a great yeah. person to have heading the ship in a crisis yeah I'd like you as my captain if if that's how you you are and yeah. that's how you're able to stay calm and focused yeah you know, that's what we want in leaders and so it's yes. so exciting yeah um, so, like, in terms of your definition of success, mm. how do you define it? Because I, I just love seeing inside people's brains about how they measure success. We talk about yes. being successful. I mean, what is success in your definition? And when you yeah. think about it in terms of your children yep. and how they might define success in your yep. eyes. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, really interesting question. I think for me, uh, when people ask that question, the expected answer is, or just um, you know that that person's successful because they have an amazing career and they run a business and they're. I, I'm going to say the opposite. To me, that isn't success. Um, that's part of your success. For me, success is. A, I look at it as a holistic view. So, success for me is yes, I own a business. It's successful. Um, but really what is success for me is um, are my kids healthy and happy? Uh, do I live a balanced life? Um, is the business successful? You know, do I spend time with my family? Uh, you, that, that to me is success. When you've got that whole um, realm of things in your, in your bubble, that to me is success, success. And where do you think that definition comes from? Is that something that you've worked on or is it something that you've always innately believed? I think over time when you're in business, um, you know, personal development happens and I listen to a lot of podcasts, I read, I will only follow people that um, I guess align with my values and, and, and give those sorts of affirmations off. Um I, I, again, I think I, I think I'm just a lucky person that has that kind of nature. Um, obviously, you know your your parents instill values in you as well. So you know they come from your mum and dad working hard and humble and and all those sorts of things. So you're always going to remain humble. Um, and and I, you know ultimately I'm a, I'm a mother. I mean to be honest, Lynn, I've just become a grandmother. But <laughs> I've become a grandmother, which is a whole other story. Congratulations, um, that's yeah. that's good. Yeah. That's so good. It's beautiful. But yeah, so success for me is is has to be a balanced view. Success. My business is a part of my success, and um, that that's yeah, that's it. My my kids and what I'm setting an example for them and showing them that. You know, they can be anything they want to be as well. I think, yeah, all those things make up success. Will there be an expectation that the kids have the opportunity to consider working in the business with you? Or? They, they're not interested, <laughs> funnily enough. <laughs> um, my kids, do you know what? My kids probably don't even know what I do half the time. So they're 18 and 20, turning 21. My son's a uh, apprentice panel beater. I did have him do work experience one and he just, one time with me and he says this is boring he goes oh but he doesn't know what I do 
Uh, he <laughs> likes to be very hands-on. I think he would have made a really good customs broker, genuinely. Um, no, they have no interest. Yeah. They don't. You know, some will ask them, what does your mum do? And they go, oh, she moves containers. <laughs> Okay. So, I mean that this this does highlight a whole nother yeah. topic we can delve into down the track is you yeah. know we've built you know this amazing company and yeah. and the kids are not particularly interested in being a part of that succession strategy yeah. then where where is the future not just five years Kelly but you know yeah. 20 years and actually starting to plan for that um, yeah. Developing your managers, are they going to be buying you out, or are you going to be looking for a buyout or an acquisition? Or yeah, you know, and these are the things I really like women to start thinking about as business owners because yeah. most of the guys I know in business actually start their business with their exit strategy in mind, whereas women start uh, because of something that they're interested in or passionate, yeah. or have a purpose or an interest in. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm generalizing. It's obviously not the case for all women. Yeah, yeah, or all men. But it definitely, I would love to get some survey results, someone, um, some brainy academic to do some studies on this because I have seen it. You know, all these women that I'm talking to around the nation who have these amazing, successful businesses, and I'll say, oh, so what, what's your exit strategy? And they'll go, God, I haven't even thought that far ahead. Whereas yeah. I'll say it to all these guys that I'm meeting across the board, yeah. the whole purpose of setting this up was to list, to sell, to, for someone to acquire, they're building a business because they're wanting to be acquired. And that yeah. is actually the money they're making on the day to day is irrelevant. The money that they're going to make when they exit. Yeah. So and it, it's become a conversation, funnily enough, of late with a couple of people and they've said the same thing. And I and, and again I said, well, I, I I don't really have a plan. For me, you know, I'm still young. My goal is to to continue and build the business. Um, do I want somebody to buy into me? You know, I'll, I'll be honest, no, I don't. I like the fact that I own the business. I don't want a buyer. I don't, someone could offer me money and it's not about that. You know, for yeah. me, it's, I, I created an extremely good culture for my staff and that is important for me. I, you know, I'm proud of the fact that, you know, I have eight staff members that I'm paying their wage and I take that seriously. So, um, I, I wouldn't want anybody else to come in and then start to dictate and change the culture in my environment. That's that's not what I'm about. Um, money's a byproduct, if that makes sense, I, I, of, of business. It's not why I'm in it either. Um, I do it because I'm passionate. I love it. I love business. E end game, obviously there has to be one at some stage. Um, yeah, where do you, you know, they're, they're discussions that are, and I've been told I need to start having them now. Um, we, yeah, it's it's a we will have that discussion probably one day. Um, yeah, yeah well, it, I'm in the same boat with Business Women Australia. And I want to bring other people into this as an entity. Yeah, and and but I'm not hundred percent sure how or why. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like it's you know it's about finding those like minded people that could potentially still keep growing. Yeah. you know what it is that you've been building so yeah. I totally get where you're coming from and it's it is it's a really interesting one and a whole I think a whole nother topic but what what it, what I'm hearing around your care for your team and your purpose in your business being so much as much about caring for them and growing and having fun in business yeah that's sort of coming through so as a leader I mean what what would you say are important attributes for leadership then in your perspective Yep. Uh, look, I think for me, leadership is leadership is it, 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 you can go into depth into in terms of leadership because I think um, for me, leadership is really somebody who's standing up and steering the ship. You know, like walk. You have to have a particular personality. I want somebody to be able to walk in and and say, you know, how are you going? How are you going today? Like with my staff. Um, there's a there's a connection all the time. Like I'll stop and have a chat. How are you today? Are you busy? You're not busy? Do you need a hand? Do you want me to make you a coffee? Do you know, like, and, and people go, why are you making the coffee? You're the director. Well, why not? Well, why can't I make that? Why can't I? They're busy. Why, um, why can't I make them a coffee? So, you know, a leadership you have to, I think, becomes about the person. When when you have self-acceptance in, your, in yourself and you're comfortable in your own skin, um, you can lead uh, a team and you can be doing the roles at the bottom 
um, but you have to also be in, in terms of a crisis or in terms of things need to change very quickly, you've got to think on your toes and you've got to stand up and you have to have that confidence to get in front of people and talk about it and bring them together and, and, and literally lead, give them direction. Um, you can't, uh, the, the junior in your office could be the leader at times because that person could have those answers and they could stand up and go, well, hang on a minute, guys, why don't we do it this way? You know, this is, if we do it this way, it's going to solve the problem. And that person's led that day, like, and that's okay. Like, they might have the, the they might be the, the junior in the office, but that's, that's still leadership. It doesn't have to be the person that's got director on their on their title. Yeah. yeah I just it's so inspiring. I mean, if I was starting my career uh way back and I had met you and I would be so interested in this as a career choice. Yeah. Honestly, it's just like a bit yeah. like me now. I'm actually thinking about <laughs> transition to retirement. Yeah. But you know what? It's yeah. um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to you know, just see the values, see yeah. them so visibly in the way that you speak and the way that you are yeah. and what you bring to this uh, industry. And as a spokesperson for this industry, I mean, what an incredible ambassador for the space to be able to attract people. I hope that you get the opportunity to some of these schools, um, particularly yeah. with a percentage of girls. Yes. They need to hear this. They need to have a conversation. Look, if you and I want to do a fireside chat, there yep. to let them know any of the schools if there's are people if any of these um ladies yeah. are listening or men that are listening who've got kids at various schools at high yep. school thinking about career kelly and i can come and do a fireside chat quicker version of this i don't think kids can sit through yeah. an hour of chatting <laughs> yeah uh, i tell you what i think it would really open some eyes absolutely um, absolutely opportunities and not yeah. only that it, i think it would also inspire potential entrepreneurs to yep. be able to build better business plans as well yep. and actually put in place more of those risk mitigation planning around that logistic supply chain yep. process because it really highlighted the importance of what you do. It's not just about getting something brought over and yep. it magically appearing here. Um, it's just so much to and the customers, brokers, it's, you know, I mean, there's kids that, that, that may not want to go to university or they don't have the, the scores you don't have to do that to be a customs broker. That's the thing. And it's a career. It's a career path. That's what we're sort of saying is, is there's other avenues. The sad thing is people don't know what we are or what we do. So it's trying to get the, the you know, the name out there and what we do and giving those opportunity for kids. I think it's a general opportunity for young kids to get into an amazing career path. Fantastic. And we look forward to getting you back on um, the Business Women Australia webinar uh, series and on our BWA podcast show as well. Um, we will. There's so many. I've got. I've written down a heap of ideas yeah. that we can talk about. Yep. I'm actually going to stop our recording here, but please, everyone, feel free to stay on the line for some chats. I'd love to also hear um, from other women um, and men who are in this space to share some of your experiences as well. But I'll just stop our recording. <laughs>